The chapter begins again with one of these rather fruitless attempts to be philosophical. In this case, trying to define energy, which they say is going to be difficult to write. Indeed, I rather think it's a waste of their time. But they go ahead to, to take this difficult task, and they take it on. And they say that energy is a scalar quantity associated with the state or condition of one or more objects. Oh, really? So what have they accomplished? What do I understand about energy from that statement? It seems vacuous to me. And then they go on to say that energy is too vague to be of help. Indeed, it is a useless definition. And so they give us a, a, a more workable definition, a looser definition. Energy is a number that we associate with the system of one or more objects. Oh, come on. What have they done? I personally feel they should not have attempted to define energy at all. Just call it a primitive notion that cannot be defined in terms of things more primitive. It's like defining what what we mean by... Uh, I can't think of an example, but... Yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably out of my league. But they then move on from energy to talk about work. And they say that work is the energy transferred to or from an object by means of a force acting on the object. I don't know if you recall my definition of work from last year, but I would like you to, and those of you who have me for the first time, I think a better definition than this is to say that work represents energy transformed, not transferred, but transformed, energy changing from one form to another. Uh, if you change... Um, <clears throat> If you have something up high and, and you drop it, gravitational energy is transformed into kinetic energy. And I call that work. And I think that's a very good definition. And I would like you to parrot it back to me on your worksheet. And I would like you to hold on to it. I think it is a very useful definition. In the case of this one, is force really necessary? If, if, you, if there's no force, does that mean that no work is done? And, and uh, let's talk about transforming chemical energy into electrical energy, as, as goes on inside of a, a, uh, an electric cell. Is there a force there? Can you identify the force? Can you work with the force? When electricity is changed into light, definitely work as energy is transformed. I, I challenge you to identify the force. So I think that the book has really missed its mark with this stuff, and I hope that what I have said you can embrace. But in that instance where force is acting, a force is applied, let us start with this uh, statement about the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus 2 times the acceleration times the displacement uh, acceleration because there is force. And then I want to take this equation and multiply both sides of it by 1 half m. And so you have 1 half m times the final squared and 1 half m times the initial squared plus 1 half m times 2a delta x. Well, the 1 half and the 2 go, so you have ma delta x. But you recognize that. That's kinetic energy. This would be final kinetic energy and initial kinetic energy. Indeed, let us subtract this from both sides, and we have the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy is equal to ma delta x, but ma 
his force times delta x. And in the case where a force is acting through a distance, I would agree that that product is equal to the work. With one caveat, which I hope that you see is necessary, and that is that this multiplication needs to be a dot product, a scalar product, that, that we are only, only take the parallel components of the force and the uh, displacement and multiply them together. This equation looms large. I do not know why, but it does. It has a name. It's called the work kinetic energy theorem. It seems to me no more than a statement of kinetic energy is changing. That is, something that was kinetic energy is becoming some other form of energy, or some other form of energy is becoming kinetic energy. That's energy transformed is equal to work. There's my definition all over again. But the book seems to feel like this is very profound, and so does the rest of the physics community. Mr. Houghton just doesn't get it. So, I have a penguin, and, and I am going to, to lift that penguin into the air. And when I lift the penguin into the air, I give it energy. That is an okay statement, but it's not completely true. It is not the penguin that has the energy. It is the system of the penguin and the earth that has the energy. It is increasing the separation between penguin and earth that constitutes the gravitational potential energy that the penguin now has. And that, that systems having energy put into them or taken out of them is, is a very useful thing to hold on to. If I then carry the penguin horizontally, I have to apply a force to the penguin to hold it up during that whole carry. But of course, the amount of work that was done here is not the product of the force I'm applying, the weight of the penguin times this distance. It is zero, because we are only interested in the parallel component. And indeed, the penguin Earth system has the same amount of energy at the end of my horizontal carry as it had at the beginning. If I then put the penguin down, then energy comes out of the Earth penguin system. The penguin is now closer to the Earth. There is less gravitational potential energy in that system. If I were a spring, then in lifting the penguin up, the penguin Earth system would gain energy, but the spring would lose energy as it expands. If the spring were to carry the penguin sideways, there would be no change in the spring's energy. And as the penguin came down, squashing the spring, what was negative work for the penguin Earth system would be positive work for the spring. It doesn't quite work that way with humans. You can't store energy back into the human by putting the penguin down, but be that as it may. Um, we speak of this energy of position, the relative position of penguin and Earth as gravitational potential energy. And the symbol for potential energy is a capital U, U sub G, gravitational potential energy. It's energy of configuration. It has to do with where the penguin is relative to the Earth. Another form of elastic energy, uh, of potential energy, is elastic potential energy. Again, energy of configuration. Where is one end of the spring relative to the other end of the spring? And, and uh, you hopefully recall the formulas for these. Um, 
I'm not sure if you were asked to do that in your worksheet, so let's, let's uh, do that now so that you can get the right answer. That gravitational potential energy for the time being will be the force you applied to the penguin to lift it away from the Earth, which is the weight of the penguin, times the distance. You have increased the separation between penguin and Earth. Force dot distance, gravitational potential energy, the amount of work that you did. For elastic potential energy, um, you just take it from me. Um, it is one half the springiness of the spring, the elastic constant, times the distance that you have moved one end of the spring relative to the other end of the spring. You may or may not recall that formula from last year. You will memorize it for this year. So, F X. This does not mean force times position. This means that force is a function of position. If it is a constant function, then, then there is only one value for work and I multiply that times the distance that that force has acted through, that one force. But what about if the force is a function of position that is not constant? If the force were to change from x value to x value, in that case, we would take the event of the force acting through the distance and I would break the event into very, very small, little distances over which the force stayed approximately constant. And I would find the work done in each of those little intervals, and then I would add them all up in order to get the total work done. And that is exactly what this statement is saying. That work is equal to, and this is an S, standing for sum, the sum of the force as a function of position times these little, teeny, infinitesimal changes in position, over which we say that the force is relatively constant. We need to develop this earlier. Indeed, more, we need to develop the idea of the integral. So you have this sheet. Um, that, that uh, in physics, an integral can be thought of as an antiderivative, doing the opposite of what derivatives do, or as a continuous sum. And I don't think you think about it this way in calculus very much. You must think about it this way in physics, or it's not going to be helpful to you. So here you have force as a function of position. At each new position, the force has a different value. And what I want to do is to add up all the forces. Well, what I'm going to do is to take that continually varying force, and I'm going to make these little changes in position be very small. And over them, I'm going to approximate the force which actually changes over that interval, but I'm going to approximate it by a constant force. So at each little delta x, I will have a constant force. Here, I've done f sub delta x and f sub xi. And I will multiply it times the distance that that force acted over, this delta x. And then I'm going to sum them all up. And when I let those delta x's become very, very small. We say infinitesimal. I change it from writing a Greek D to writing a Latin D. And this means a very, very small change in, in, in X. And I change the sigma to the stretched out S. And the definition of this continuous summation is the limit, as those little widths get very, very small, of the product of the force over each of those little widths times the little width. 
trust me, you will become happy with this. You will make it work for you. It will become your friend. Instead of as a continuous sum, to think of an integral as an antiderivative is usually the way we calculate integrals. That if the derivative of position with respect to time is velocity, then the integral of velocity with respect to time is position. And then there's this tricky little thing that you add on this constant of proportionality, because indeed, if you were to take the derivative of x plus a constant with respect to time, you also get that same velocity. So here is your first rule for integration. And, and if you have the integral of t raised to the b with respect to time, with respect to t, then what you do is you raise that b by 1 and multiply it by 1 over b plus 1. And then add on that constant of proportionality. Because if you look at this, if you were to take the derivative of that, then you would take this and you would multiply it times that. That would be a 1. And then you would multiply, divide, you would reduce this exponent by 1 if you were taking the derivative. So it would be t to the b. And this would just be a 0 here when you took the derivative of that with respect to time, because it's a constant. It does not change with respect to time. It works. Just learn to do that. If you have two functions of position, um, u and v, then, then a, a constant times the function is the same thing. The integral of the constant times the function is the same thing as the constant times the integral of the function that you can pull constants outside of the integral. And if you had sum of two functions, the integral of the sum of two functions, that's same as the, in, the sum of the integrals of the two functions. Finally, if, if uh, this is called a definite integral, where we put values at the top and the bottom of the integral uh, symbol, and, and this means I'm integrating from j to k, but what you do is use your rules to find what this is, 1 over b plus 1, x to the b plus 1, and then I put a long bar, I put the j and the k, and then what you do is you take the upper limit and you put that in for x minus the lower limit put in for x. That's how you do a definite integral. It all seems like gibberish. We will practice. You will get good. So here you have the first exercise. What is the integral of x squared as a function of x? And you take that 2, raise it by 1, and put 1 over 2 plus 1 out in front. And you get 1 third x to the third. And then you need to put that constant of proportion, constant of integration out there. OK, hope that works. Please try this one. And I think you might find it very helpful to, instead of writing 1 over y to the 3, to write this as y to the minus 3. And you would take minus 3 and add 1 to it, put 1 over minus 3 plus 1 out front. Don't forget the constant of integration. Please put your answer to that on your worksheet. And, and uh, in a couple of slides, I'm going to tell you what the right answers were, but I would like you right now to see if you can get that answer. Again, here is a constant times a, 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 a function, and, and uh, so don't forget you can pull that outside the integral. Please evaluate that one. This time you have two functions being, uh, being added together. Um, and so it's just take the integral of that one and then add on the integral of this one. And then there's a single constant that you add on after those two. 
all answers on the worksheet, please. What about this one? Same, same process. And here's a bit of a challenge. Integrate acceleration with respect to time, call the unknown constant v sub 1. Whoa, I thought I was keeping up. I'm completely confused. What do you want me to do? And it would look like this. You integrate a with respect to time. When you do that, there a is, is, is a constant, and so this is t to the 0, and so that becomes 0 plus 1 and 1 over 1 out in front. So try it. If you take the derivative of a to the t, a t with respect to time, do you not get a? Yes, I do. Boom, boom. And you have a constant of integration, but we'll put in v1 as a constant of integration. Oh my, look at that. That's like final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Ah, so cool. Now, integrate your result with respect to time and call the unknown constant x sub 1. And if you're feeling courageous, you could pause the show and do that. And then I'm going to show you what should have happened. You would take this result and integrate it again with respect to time. Oh my, that becomes t to the 1, plus 1 is 2, and then you put 1 half out in front, and vi becomes vi times time, and there's a constant, and we let that constant be x sub i, and there you have x final is equal to x initial, plus vi t, plus 1 half at squared. And that is why that is the formula for position where there is acceleration present. Find the work. Oh, this is the sort of stuff we're going to be doing for homework. Find the work done when a force given as this function of position. Oh, look, force is changing from x value to x value. X from 3 to 5. Again. You could stop the show and see if you could do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and make sure that, that uh, this is working for you. Work is equal to the integral of force times these little changes in position. There I put in what the force is, 5x, and then you know how to evaluate that. And then put in 5 for x minus, and put in 3 for x, and see what you get for the amount of work done. Find the area under this curve. Oh my, it's just this all over again, that I'm going to find the area by taking v, which is a function of time, versus time, and I'll find the area under by adding up little teeny bits of time, dt's, times how tall each of these rectangles is. It's that tall. So you would just do the integral, a definite integral, from 1 to 5 of this function, dt. Give it a try. Get an answer. Now, this is, gets very challenging, and I hope you're having fun. Um, if, if you are, have never studied integrals before, you have not taken calculus, you're taking it for the first time right now, then you could turn in your work for 9 through 12, and if it is pretty and correct, I will give you extra credit. If you have already done learned how to integrate. I want you to do it anyway, but I'm not giving you extra credit. But here is the task. What is the volume of a sphere? And I'm going to use integrals to do it, and the trick comes in figuring out what to add up. You need to think about this as continuous summation. And what I've decided to do 
is to slice the sphere into pancakes. Each pancake will have a thickness dy, and it will have an area that is equal to pi times r squared. But r will be a function of what y I am at. You see, I want it to be a function of y so I can evaluate an integral. I have to sort of think forwards. So r is equal to, little r is equal to the radius of the sphere squared minus y squared. There you have that. And so I'm going to add up this from negative r to r pi times r squared times dy. Notice pi r squared is an area and if I multiply that by the thickness, that's a volume. So I've got a little bit of volume, and then I'll add up all those little bits of volume, and that will get me the total volume. So here is the, the task. This should be very easy for those of you who are seeing integration for the first time and the others. But I will give you extra credit. Do a good job. Evaluate it from negative r to r. Uh, do it correctly, and you should get the well-known result for the volume of a sphere. And I personally am always tickled to death that I can do that correctly. I hope you feel some joy in being able to get that to work out as well. Another challenge, find the area of a triangle. Well, that's a very well-known result, the area of a triangle of height x and and base b. But um, I'm going to do it by integration. I'm going to cut it up into little rectangles. The area of that rectangle will be the height as a function of x, that is h over b times x. Try it out. Um, h would be the height of the thing here, that, that this is to x as b is to h, the total height. So I have figured out how to write the height of this as a function of x, and then I'll just do the integral, a definite integral, evaluated from x equals 0 out to x. Equals b. Is that right? No, it's not. I want to do it from No, I do. From x equals 0 to x equals b. That'll get you the right answer. What am I doing wrong here? to be as this is to x. B is to h as this is to x. So this is b over h times x. Oh, I'm confused. Do it. Volume of a cone. And, and this time you're going to bite, cut it up into disks. And, and uh, um, you could think about making a cone, looking at it in cross-section, get the radius of your disk as a function of where you are along your height of the cone, and then add them all up. And finally, uh, this problem 12. Do it. Do it well. Here, then, are the answers that I promised you. Um, in, you could go back and check to make sure that in uh, 1 through 8 you got those correct. I hope this works. Integration is going to be a big part of your life, and, and I hope I haven't spoiled it for you.